We're transitioning from a Heisman Trophy winner to a Nobel Peace Prize winner. I don't know uh, how many people have been able to say that. So, uh, Dr. Jim Muller, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for interviewing me. All right. Um, so we, uh, as we said with uh, with uh, John Hewitt, our, who, who went right before you, we're, we like to kind of start off at the beginning here on Catching Up With. So where did you grow up? Indianapolis. And uh, what did your parents do in Indianapolis? So my father was an obstetrician. Uh, my mother, I, I sound, I don't sound very Irish with Muller, <laughs> but my mother was Courtney. Okay. And is very Irish, so it was kind of a Swiss German and Irish background. Yeah. Uh, you said your father was an obstetrician. You obviously went on to become a doctor, a cardiologist. Did he kind of inspire you to pursue medicine? My father inspired me in many ways, and uh, he died. 10 days ago at age 100. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, so we're, the family is grieving, uh, uh, but we're looking back on all the great things that dad did. He was, went to Notre Dame. He was on the Notre Dame freshman basketball team. Wow. He was an electrical engineer who learned how to wire some of the uh, dormitories here so he could keep the lights on later. Yeah, wow, that's great. <laughs> Um, and so I assume you chose to attend Notre Dame to kind of follow in your dad's footsteps? And, and my uncles, and then my brother and my son. So we are a traditional Notre Dame family. Yeah. And have benefited massively from the university. Yeah, I heard some stories yesterday talking to some of your classmates. It sounded like you were a real kind of leader on campus, dorm president type thing. What, what dorms did you live in? Uh, we started in Stanford, and then Dillon, and then uh, Baden. And, uh, we did, we did win uh, one award I'm very proud of. There was a homecoming decoration of the dorm. Yeah. And I don't know if any of my colleagues remember this, but we had a crane that uh, I had brought from my construction job that lifted up the Notre Dame rocket that uh, went five stories high. <laughs> so we won the, the uh, Baden decorating, home decorating award for that crane. The next year I took that crane uh, in my construction job and drove it into a bridge that was too low and <laughs> that crane then disappeared <laughs> and so what did you study at Notre Dame I studied uh, pre pre-med physics I started in physics and then I realized that I wasn't I couldn't understand second-order differential equations and I thought I can't do this uh, and I had seen a model of medicine that's science and people so I wanted to do science and people uh, and then I asked my father this is an amazing situation. I, when I went started Notre Dame, Dad said, what language are you going to study? And I said, German, I like science. He, he said, come out in the backyard. He said, you see that up there? That's Sputnik. And he said, you should study Russian. You might learn, some, they must know something. Yeah. So I came here, I started studying Russian, and I found a teacher named Mr. Czech. He was actually crippled, and he would walk this quad, uh, and he, he, uh, he gave A's to everyone in the class. I thought, this is the way to get into med school. I should just keep bringing in these A's. And uh, my roommate, Ed Ward, and I, uh, at the time, and then later, Steve Pape, we, Ed was in the class. We decided never to speak English to each other. We were good friends, so we labeled everything in the room in Russian. <laughs> and so I got a Russian start here. Uh, a lot of a lot of very important things started here. Yeah. What is sort of your favorite memory from your time as a student here? I guess I've just told you, Mr. Check okay. and Father Hesburgh. So Father Hesburgh was on the Civil Rights Commission then. He um, very specifically at Selma. He was talking about Selma and how we needed to support the people that were marching there. And uh, my brother, my sister, and I decided to go to Selma. Wow. Uh, so we, I remember we got on a bus to Indianapolis. We got trained in nonviolence. They said, if you get bitten by dogs, it's better to be in a pile. So they were teaching us how to form piles. I always thought it would be good to be the first one to start the pile so you'd have these people on, around you. But uh, that we did because of Father Hesper. And that, you know, being there in, in Selma must have had kind of a profound impact on you. It did, it did. It, uh, I remember getting to Selma, we were there the last day. We were with 50,000 people in a field. Uh, and I was a little frightened. There were National Guards around us with Confederate flags on them with guns. 
and uh, it was a little frightening, but I saw a small group of uh, African-American 10-year-old girls dancing and singing about their freedom, and I thought, you shouldn't, I should not be afraid, I should march with them. Yeah, it's a great story. Um, when, when you finished up and, and graduated at Notre Dame, did you know you wanted to pursue medicine? Did you kind of go right, right down that path? I went uh, directly to Johns Hopkins Medical School. Uh, I was probably one of the last to get in, but I got in thanks to <laughs> Russian. And uh, I eventually became a better student there. But I, um, I went right in, into medicine. And then I heard a doctor talk about his trip to Russia. And I thought, well, you know, I learned this Russian at Notre Dame, so maybe I should go to Russia. And then another doctor, a psychiatrist, was teaching a course, and he said, the world's going to destroy itself with nuclear weapons. And you know, this was after the Cuban Missile Crisis, where we'd been within minutes of a nuclear war. And he, he, the psychiatrist said, we have to build some bridges with the Russians. I said, well, I speak Russian. I'm from Notre Dame. Notre Dame people can do things. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'll try and go to Russia and build bridges. Wow. So I went to Moscow during the Vietnam War, uh, I was living alone. I was isolated in a med school. I spoke only Russian for seven months and got to know the Russian medical people. What was that you know, experience like? It's the height of the Cold War kind of, and you, an American going over and live in Russia, were you ever kind of you know, scared or worried? Or what was, that, what was it like living there at that time? I, I wasn't worried for some reason. I probably should have been. But uh, at that time, 67, it's 22 years after World War II. So most Russians actually viewed us as allies against Hitler. So they were very gracious. Now, they didn't like the name Mueller yeah. because that was a typical German <laughs> name. And I, but once they learned I was an American, they were quite happy. So I lived in a small uh, sequestered intellectual group that was quite pleasant to me while we were bombing Russian ships in Haiphong Harbor. Wow. Um, so then when you finish up medical school, you know, what was next? What was kind of your, what was your path after that? Well, uh, something very good happened to me in medical school. I, I met a um, nurse, a midwife from South Bend, Indiana, wow. who uh, was delivering a baby. And I watched her, and that was Kathleen my wife, and uh, we, we, became, we were married while I was in med school. Uh, we never met when she was in South Bend, but I met her in med school. So that, that was a really good part of med school. And you, you, know, you became a cardiologist. Why cardiology? Why were you drawn to that? I liked a, a specialty where you could really do something. And uh, you know, there, there are some specialties that I admire the doctors who practice them, but they're, the disease is kind of winning. Cardiology, there's an awful lot that can be done. So I, w I was drawn to that. I kind of like the speed of cardiology. You know, I, I didn't mind being on call and running in and doing what you needed to do. It was, and I had some very good cardiology role models. Uh, Eugene Brownwald was one of the people that I studied under at, at Harvard. So that, that helped. So, you know, you mentioned Harvard. You ended up working in Boston primarily? Yeah, so I got rejected from Harvard Medical School. Then I got accepted to study cardiology at, at uh, the Brigham Hospital, which is Harvard. And then, I, then I, uh, became, I was invited to be on the faculty, and that's where I spent my career. Yeah. Um, now, as you, you know, move into your career as a cardiologist and a you know, professor there at Harvard, did you maintain an interest in what was going on with Russia? Not much. I was too, you know, we had small children. I, but in 1978, the idea arose that you could win a nuclear war. And I remember walking up to my car thinking, that is so crazy. One side loses 30 million, the other side loses 10 million, and you've won the side that loses 10 million. I thought, those Russians, doctors that I knew, they don't agree with that. Yeah. So I thought I could show you the spot where I thought, let's try to build a peace movement of Russian and American doctors against the idea that you could win a nuclear war. Uh, I actually wrote Father Hesperick, and he said, this is a very good idea, and I will support you. I, I think he might have even said, as you will be attacked many times for what you're doing. <laughs> so I, I um, 
got the idea in 78, and by 1980, I had paired up with Dr. Bernard Lowndes, very famous. I was junior faculty, he was a professor. And he wrote Brezhnev's doctor, who had been my teacher in med school. And he said, we'd like to form a movement against the concept that you can win a nuclear war. Uh, will you join us? So Chazov actually was Brezhnev's doctor. And Brezhnev had a Medtronic pacemaker in place. So Chazov went to Brezhnev and he said, these Americans want me to form a movement against the military. What do you think? And Brezhnev told him, I'll protect you from the Russian military. They, they're not going to like this. And uh, so Chazov and Laon and I and Eric Shivian, and then another Notre Dame fellow joined here. It's just John Pastore. And John, maybe some of you know him, he's a year ahead of our class, 64. Uh, he became a very important leader in this movement. It went from a small group of us in 80 to 160,000 doctors in 50 nations uh, throughout the world, and then it was honored with the Nobel Prize. Wow, so the Nobel Prize in 1985, right? The group was called International Physicians for the Prevention of uh, Nuclear War. Um, you know, when, when, the no when you were awarded the Nobel Prize, I mean, what was your reaction? You know, it started with an idea you had, and all of a sudden the Nobel Peace Prize must have been a pretty, uh, pretty surreal. So I'll be honest here, um, among Notre Dame friends, uh, the movement was a dreadful part of my life. I had a job. I was writing, supposed to be writing science articles. I had patients I was taking care of. I had small children at home. My wife was a single mother. It was horrible, horrible. But I would wake at night thinking if I don't do this, tens of millions of people might die. Yeah. So I thought I had to do it right. But by 1984, I was completely exhausted and I would have been uh, fired from my job, estranged from my children, and possibly divorced. And I thought, this is not a good path. You've got to get out of this. So I resigned from the movement in 84. So in 85, I'm asleep one morning, and John Pastore, my Notre Dame friend, calls me and he says, hey, Jim, we just won the Nobel Peace Prize. Wow. Uh, you said earlier that Father Hesper told you you'd be attacked for this. Was he right? Were you attacked oh. for it? During the Nobel Prize ceremony, we had a press conference, kind of, we were up on a stage, and there was maybe 10 television cameras there, and 15 other reporters in Oslo, where the Peace Prize is, and the uh, Reynolds from ABC News, he says, well, you American doctors, you're idiots. You're collaborating with Russians. You're dupes of the Russians. You're not helping the Jewish dissidents who the Russian psychiatrists are putting in prisons with false diagnoses. You're a bunch of idiots. And uh, it, Dr. Lown was the president of the group. I'd been the secretary. Dr. Lown says, look, we're, we don't agree with these Russians, but we're trying to work together to save lives. We agree on that narrow principle. And just at that moment, a Russian correspondent collapsed. He fell to the ground. And I looked at him, and he was blue. And because I'd been running a coronary care unit, I knew this is a cardiac arrest. So at that time, you give mouth to mouth, which I did. And then John Pastore started helping, pumping on the chest. So we're now on world television, resuscitating a Russian journalist at this press conference. And John's, we intubated the patient. Uh, the hotel had an endotracheal tube, and we're waiting for the ambulance. And the thought occurred to me, I have not put this in many public documents, but it's a long time. Thought occurred to me that it would be good if a Russian was pounding on the chest and an American was doing the breathing. Yeah. So I looked at John and I said, John, maybe we should invite a Russian doctor to pound on the chest. And John immediately, his father was a politician, he immediately understood the symbolism we were after. Yeah. And so John got Chasov. Chasov started pumping on the chest. And the next day in the International Herald Tribune, the New York Times, there's a big photo, Russian and American doctors combined to save a life. Wow. Which was a metaphor for what we were trying to yeah. do. It helped us. Yeah, it was quick thinking. Uh, so what was it about the group that made it so success successful? Why did people listen? Was it because it was physicians telling them, you know? 
if you look back at the history of the concepts, physicists are the main leaders. The people that built the nuclear weapons founded the Pugwash movement, which is you can't use these things. They're, they are just going to lead to disaster for the world, and it's still a problem, and it's maybe even a bigger problem with what if ISIS got a nuclear weapon? And uh, so it's, it's the problems there. The physicists were saying these are not usable, but the physicists don't physicists, and there may be some in the audience, don't talk to the public. Doctors talked, are used to talking to the public. Mm -hmm. So I think we had a channel to the public that we needed. We, we were, if you look at the history of it, we were the first group to really raise the alarm, and then the nuclear freeze started, and then there was a million-person march in New York. All of it followed on, but the physicians were, were historically the start of get, making this a public issue. So you obviously had an extremely successful medical career also, but you always seem to be kind of taking up different causes. Um, fast forward a number of years, and there was a crisis in the church, especially in, in Boston where you were living, and, and you kind of started another movement, uh, Voice of the Faithful. Tell us you know, what that was and, and where the idea came from. Kathleen and I were sitting at breakfast in Boston, and we read in the Boston Globe that children had been abused by priests, and that the priest had been sent from one parish to another to another, and that Cardinal Law knew about it. And we were, like many people here, horrified, and we didn't know what to do. So we founded a discussion group in our church, and the first week we had six of us, and the next week we had 12, and they, because they said, well, you ran this other movement, Jim, will you lead this? And I said, yes, I would. And I, I kind of knew a lot of organizing techniques from the peace movement, and I said, I think we need to have a weekly meeting and we'll, we'll announce this and anyone that can come wants to. So it just kept doubling and it ended up 30,000 people called Voice of the Faithful. We formed a council. We voted that Cardinal Law should leave Boston and uh, he did. Uh, so, and I think the, the main message we were trying to transmit was that this, the sexual abuse cover up was horrible but it revealed an institutional flaw of, I still will say this, of the Catholic Church, which is not a strong enough voice for the laity. So we were thinking there should be a stronger voice for the laity. And I have to say, while we failed with Benedict and the other popes, I think Pope Francis, uh, we didn't create Pope Francis, but we, the voice of the faithful was saying things very much like what Pope Francis says and does. And the motto of the group was, keep the faith, change the church. Why did you choose that as the motto? I was on the phone one day, and we were running out of money or something, and I remember saying to uh, somebody, keep, keep the faith. You know, a lot of people say that when they're in a struggle. And then I, I remember saying, change the church. And so when I, I did write, for those of you that want to hear more about this, there is, this, this, I'm not trying to sell a book. But there is a book called Keep the Faith, Change the Church, and it's on Amazon. Um, where does your passion come from for, for these kind of uh, social and, and moral causes that you've kind of on the side of your real career, you've worked on your whole life, dating all the way back to Selma? I think Catholic social teachings get embedded pretty early. You know, I, I saw my father live that kind of a life. And uh, I grew up in a very privileged situation with dad and a great family. Uh, and um, I think the idea, I think the Jewish is tikka malom to heal the world. That was taught. And of course, coming to Notre Dame, where you're taught you can solve big problems. Uh, that, I'm finding some of my roots here very helpful. Yeah. Uh, you spoke about Father Hesburgh earlier, obviously passed away earlier this year. Uh, what kind of an impact did, did he have on you, and, and what type of relationship did you have with him? So I knew him pretty well because of the, his support of the peace movement. And he said mass for this movement in Moscow, in a Moscow hotel. Which I don't know if that was approved or not. And when we needed uh, letters of support, he would, he would write them. Uh, he also lined us up with the National Catholic Bishops Conference, where I met Cardinal Bernadine through that. So it was, it was pretty close. He was, he was very supportive, very accessible. Whenever I needed help, I would call him. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, you, you started your own company, a, a medical device company called Infrared X. Tell us a little bit about you know, why you made that decision and, and what the company does. So I've seen a lot of patients die of 
cardiogenic shock, heart failure, and uh, I, that's all caused by rupture of a plaque that is rich in cholesterol. And I wanted to f find a diagnostic method where you could tell what the plaques are made out of. So I met a spectroscopist uh, when I was leading the Heart Institute in Kentucky. Uh, I was doing research, and he said, oh, you can do near-infrared spectroscopy within the heart. So 17 years ago, I decided to try to just make a near-infrared measurement of these plaques in the coronary artery. It, I thought it would take two years, maybe $10 million. It took 17 years and $240 million. And the company is in crisis as we speak uh, because of lack of funding. We had a failed IPO, but the technology is working. We have eight heart attacks that occurred and we had measurements in advance, yeah. and we actually predicted exactly which plaque would cause the heart attack. So I'm right now, I'm in another hard spot yeah. uh, uh, where something's going to happen later today or maybe Monday or Tuesday with our company uh, that where we will get our funding straight. We've had layoffs. We, it's been miserable. Uh, we have a scientific success and a financing failure at the moment. Well, best of luck with that. Um, you know, it was you went from kind of civil rights to the Cold War and uh, nuclear disarmament to the the crisis in the church. Do you have a, a a new cause you're working on, or something you know you feel passionately about that you're going to devote some time to? I would like to finish the heart attack work, and I think that's going to take three to five years, uh, and so that we can predict heart attacks and prevent them. There are many treatments, so predictions the the hold up. After that, if I'm still functional, and you know, dad, dad got a hole in one at age 93, so <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll be given some of that. Uh, if I do, the, the topic that has appealed to me is international cooperation, UN. I know Notre Dame starting an international relations school, uh, the Peace Inst, the Kraut Peace Institute. I think I'd like to write a little bit more about in a world that's got global problems global warming, population, et cetera, that cooperation between nations becomes more and more important to supranational organizations. So I would, I think that's what I would do if I were privileged to have some more energy. Yeah, well, you've got the background to do it. Uh, at this time, I think we're gonna take a couple of questions from the audience. If anybody has a, has a question for uh, Dr. Muller here, raise your hand. Don't be shy. Maybe some memories from Notre Dame. I'll start it off. I, I uh, while they're while they're thinking of their questions, I, I heard a story talking to one of your classmates yesterday um, about a party you organized uh, when you were uh, I think a senior at a Howard Johnson downtown, and that it was a toga party, and that you had some interesting security picked out uh, guys working security at the party. Do you remember who that was? I th it might have been football players. <laughs> that's, that's what I heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'd forgotten about that party. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were going to talk about the hearse. Well, tell that, share that story as well. I think it was Gary Jones. Maybe people remember him. Had a hearse, and we wanted to go to uh, the Indianapolis 500, and uh, Harry was there. You were there. Anybody else was in that hearse ride? Um, Maybe they don't want to admit it. No, well, <laughs> as, as long as you haven't had a second ride, you're okay. But, uh, <laughs> but we, we rode this hearse down to Indianapolis, about 10 or 15, 10 Notre Dame guys. It was crowded. Don't you remember that, Harry? It was crowded. And John Ewart was in the hearse with us, and uh, John Kuntz drove the hearse. He just told me that. I, I was thinking we would reenact it if everyone's still around. <laughs> <laughs> but we... Uh, we had this case of beer and we were drinking and uh, riding along and I do remember stopping at a gas station in Peru, Indiana, somewhere around there, where the hearse pulls in and then all these Notre Dame guys come running out, running to the men's room. It was quite a scene. The guy's probably still not recovered from seeing that. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? Anybody got a question yeah, for got Dr. Moore? i a Mo? question. Sure. Uh, Dr. Moore, could you explain again uh, in terms of your spectroscopy, were you able to try to prevent heart attacks or just identify susceptible areas of plaque rupture? You, sa you sound like you're a physician. I have a background. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, as as he uh, implies, the uh, everyone it's it's everyone believes that heart attacks are caused 
by a cholesterol-rich plaque that has a covering that ruptures and then a clot forms. So that's indisputable. Our device is FDA approved to find those plaques. What we haven't done yet is we haven't made a measurement in a large organized study and then proven that we can find these in advance with blinding and everything. So right now I have a, we have a study of 1,200 patients. It's being done in 45 hospitals around the world where we've made this measurement and we're in a very unfortunate situation of waiting for heart attacks to happen. Once 10 or 20 happen, we'll unblind the data probably in December and I believe based on our preliminary data that we're going to say we can find these. So once you find them, what could you do? Well, lots of things. There's stents. There's a new type of stent that gets resorbed. It's made out of resorbable suture material. There are, there are drug-coated balloons. There are new drugs that can lower the cholesterol to 30. There are many treatments. So when we find these, it's going to be like a sword in the stone, and then all these treatment companies will be lined up ready to try and treat them. And I, that's why I think it will... Pr you know, it's not like Alzheimer's, where you can figure out someone's got Alzheimer's, but there's no treatment. This is the opposite. Uh, there are plenty of treatments. You just don't know which one of us has got a... I actually introduced a term called vulnerable plaque uh, in 1989. And uh, which one of us has a vulnerable plaque? That's what cannot be known right now. But once it's known, the treatments are not far behind. Any other questions? All right, well, I have one more question. Oh, we got one? Here we go. So, doctor, when you were here in, as an undergraduate, you went from physics to, I guess, pre-med. What was the one course or two that set you on the way here? Uh, you know, I kind of liked organic chemistry <laughs> with uh, Emil Hoffman, was was very good. And uh, Brother Raphael Wilson in biology was a very good teacher. All right, I got one more question. You uh, you live in the Boston area. We're going to be headed there uh, this fall for the Shamrock Series at Fenway against BC. Uh, putting you on the spot here, will you agree to host either a toga party or <laughs> or get a hearse for the purpose of tailgating? <laughs> yes. All right. Well, we'll see you then. <laughs> Dr. Muller, thanks so much for being here. Give him okay. a round of applause. Okay.